So Olin, a lot has changed on how we handle malt nowadays. A little bit. We just spent a bunch of money upgrading our system thanks to this guy. So Olin, take us through what they're gonna learn today. We're gonna talk about a mill size, roller size, bucket loaders, kernel size and plumpness in European versus domestic. We're gonna talk multi-head weighers that are digitally controlled. And we're gonna talk auction barrier bags, Chris. All seems pretty sweet. Back in the day, you would call in an order as a customer. One of us would run back into the back, grab a scale, grab a bag, and just kind of hand scoop it. And we'd come really close to accurate numbers. But you, over the last two years, have really helped us professionalize our malt game here. So let's go over some of the things we've done. Let's start with the mill. Yeah, well, starting back in 1995, I was hand cranking mill, Chris, so that, that could only last no so way. long. <laughs> By 98, we were motorized. Before we got a Schmidlin malt mill, if you remember that. Uh, and now we, we just invested almost $250,000 into our malt handling system to ensure quality basically from start to finish. It's pretty awesome and we've got some footage to go over, but let's start with the mill. Probably, I don't wanna say the most important thing, but we mill a lot of grains for our customers and we wanna make sure we do it really well. What makes our mill, the new mill especially, stand out from a homebrew mill? Yeah, well, it's a four roller mill and, and the, the diameter of the rollers are really large. It's an, it's an RMS mill. That's what really high-end uh, breweries are gonna be using that are kind of in craft size. And what, what stands out to me is to explain first that when you've got uh, four roller mills, you can set two different gaps. So in this clip, you'll see the four rollers. Two of them have pulleys on them to make them the active. The other two are passive based off of that, but each one is adjustable. Let's take some grains, for example. European Pilsner malts like Bayerman and Viking, they're, they have a plumper kernel size. So one of the specs that I look for on malt sheets is the amount of kernels, the percentages that are over 2.5 millimeters in size. And then typically a malt kernel ranges from 2.2 to 2.8. And uh, European Pilsner malt will be around 97% on average above 2.5 millimeters. So that means you're getting really plump kernels. You can set your mill with a two roller mill and you, you're gonna set it for uh, 2.5 millimeter kernels and get a really efficient crush. But some of the domestic malts, especially if you've had a drought year, the kernel sizes are a little bit small, maybe only 90% of the kernels are above 2.5 millimeters. So that means that if you set your, your only, if you only have two rollers and you set that gap, to run at 2.5, the other 10% that are falling below that size really aren't getting crushed. So that's kind of the best way to describe it is you can set your first set of rollers a little bit looser to accommodate the plumper kernels, which is the majority of the malt. And then you set your second rollers a little bit tighter so that you're getting all the other kernels that, that rest of that 10%. And that really increases the efficiency for all of our customers who are getting crushed malt from us. Yeah, no, that goes back and Vito and I covered this a couple of weeks ago, but the idea of, you know, when you have those nice big diameter rollers, not quite that big, but the kernel goes through much nicer, but you can do just the initial crack and then the fine milling because the husk will go through without getting all shredded up. Correct. So not only did we invest heavily in this RMS four roller mill, we do sieve tests afterwards. Chris, is it sieve or sieve? Tomato, tomato. I say sieve. I think it's sieve. Maybe we should bet a six pack on this. Sounds good to me. Basically what a sieve test is, is where we take four pans and we put a screen in each pan and we weigh out a specific amount of milled grains, put it in the top pan. Each pan has three balls in it and you have two lines you tape out. You go for a certain amount of time back and forth every forget how many seconds you slam the top of it, just to really shake it up. They make mechanical ones, but we don't have one of those. So it's a pretty popular and common thing for it to be done by hand. Here's a video of Colin doing it. It's gonna take out the test sieve for us to run the test with. That's so cool. This is Colin performing the sieve test. Every 15 seconds, he taps 
that and then keeps going and he does this for three minutes, 18 inch slide. So essentially after you're done, you then weigh out what's held up by the screen or the sieve each pan and you get a profile of what that's like. How much is the little tiny bits getting through everything? How much are held in the course as perfectly done husks? Um, so that you get a good measurement. And we've worked with different malt manufacturers to come up with what we call the practical milling for craft breweries and the type of false bottoms they typically have. That works out pretty well for most of us home brewers few people that might be a little bit too small based off of if they have like a really coarse um, or, or cut slot false bottom like a, a copper tube that they've cut slots into but it maybe is not quite uh, fine enough if you had wedge wire perfect false bottom and let's say Anheuser-Busch's brewery. And that's the biggest factor is we don't want to send out it's that balance between sending out malt that is too fine that's going to clog the average homebrewing false bottom and trying to then find just the right crush where the efficiency is, is high enough. Exactly. And I think that's why it's called practical because it just falls perfectly in the middle of that. And as a home brewer, I count on my 78 to 80% efficiency, which is kind of my, my constant area that I usually get in our mill gets us there every time. And we've gotten a lot of feedback over the years. Uh, your, your milling is too fine, your milling is too coarse. It really depends on what type of false bottom you have. And that's why we've said it's, it's in the past been ideal to have your own mill because you can set the gap that you like. But the four roller mill does give us a chance to get into that sweet spot a little bit more efficiently where you're getting high efficiency and we're not clogging false bottoms. Yeah, and I, I think it's, you know, with those six inch rollers and four rollers, you're not doing nearly as much damage to the husks. And then those husks will go through that second set of rollers really well without shredding up. So I think we are giving a better product now. All right, so now we have that freshly milled grain or unmilled grain, but we now have to get it from a normal working height up to our filler. And so instead of an auger style auger that can further damage the husks of that grain, we use a bucket style. In the video clip here, you'll see how it's gently conveying that grain up to the very top. We have to lift it up because the packaging machine is 12 feet tall. So you, you can't just throw it up there uh, and load bags directly in. And you'll see why in a second, because at the top of that, at the apex, we have the coolest part, in my opinion, of the whole thing, which is a 16-headed weigher machine. Yeah, 16-head multi-head filler, uh, which is professional in the food packaging industry. Exactly. So in the video, you'll see where we're holding grain. Each one of those is independently weighed. And there's a computer that takes the right average to know what to dump into the final product below. So before it used to be my steady hand versus his steady hand of who gets it in the bag best and which scale we're using and what type of bag we're filling to which way it leans. And now it's pretty much dead on, which for you gives you a number you can trust. You need five pounds, you need three pounds, you need one pound. It's going to be that accurate number. So Chris, the part about our new packaging system that I'm most excited about is these oxygen barrier bags. You put a lot of time and energy into sourcing those properly. I did. Uh, they're actually really expensive bags, but we wanted to do this as part of this upgrade so that the malt's arriving to the customer and they can store it in an oxygen barrier bag for at least with mill grain uh, past a year. Yeah, no, they're not just an average bag either. They have a Ziploc top, which is really cool. When you get them, the seal will be above it. So once you cut that, off, you still get to use the Ziploc and they have a gusseted bottom, which just makes them kind of handy. If you're just going to be using a pound or two, you get to store them quite nicely and you can hear it and feel it. It's quite a bit thicker than your average bag because of the oxygen barrier layer that's put on there. Yeah. And while we always recommend that you have a mill at home or we, we like the fact that you can mill, you know, right on the day for the gap that you like, I feel a lot better about sending milled grain out uh, because now you can you can store this for up to a year you can use it you can reseal it 
and you're just getting a freshness uh, right into the mash tun. Exactly. And, you know, to, as these guys have seen in our videos, I'm for the most part using milled grains now. I don't even bother doing it at home anymore. It's just nice, less cleanup. But it's, they've been tasting super fresh coming out of these new bags. I think there's maybe a little something to say about that, and I don't think this is a big deal, but by eliminating milling in your brew house, if you were doing that, you're, you're also cutting down on potential contamination. Quite a bit, and that's, you know, Vito went over that a couple weeks ago, but the idea of uh, not milling where you brew just from a lactobacillus on the dust issue. All right, so this machine's pretty cool. The first thing it has to do is pick up these bags all stacked up, and you can see those robotic vacuum arms hold it up. Then another machine's sole job is to break the seal of the Ziploc. Then another guy comes in and grabs it and opens it all the way up and brings it over to the fill head. Fills in there, that's pretty cool. But then it goes to the next one and you'll see it fluff. And basically it's getting it to all settle in the bag better so it'll seal up nicer for you. Then the last one, which you can see the padding on there, pushes out all that excess air and such before it seals it up. Then finally, it does two different heat seals to make sure it's perfect at the top, and then we ship it out to you. I'm just excited we have an automated fluffer now, Chris. <laughs> Some people pay extra for that. Well, thanks for watching this video. It's been a huge investment in increasing the quality of grain we get out to you, and all of it from the nines, the four roller mill, the weighing machine, the filling machine, and these awesome new bags. Olin, you did all the work on this. You learned, I think, how to read in Chinese to, to understand parts of this process, which was pretty impressive. But, uh, and thanks to your brother, Darren, because he's the one who actually got it running and it runs awesome. I know way too much about uh, plastics now, Chris, bag plastics.